Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor for Data Diversity. Thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Lessons in Data Modeling with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss how data modeling fits into an overall enterprise architecture. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. And we very much encourage you to chat with us and with each other throughout the webinar. To do so, click the chat icon in the top right hand corner of this, that screen to our activate that feature. And for questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A section, or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag lessons data modeling. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of the session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Donna Burbank. She is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience in data management, metadata management, and enterprise architecture. She is currently Managing Director of Global Data Strategy, an international data management consulting company. Her background is multifaceted across consulting, product development, product management, brand strategy, marketing, and business leadership. She has worked with dozens of Fortune 500 companies worldwide in the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and speaks regularly at industry conferences, including data diversity conferences. Donna, hello and welcome. Hello, thank you. So I am going to jump in. So today's topic, as Shannon mentioned, is on enterprise architecture and specifically how data modeling fits in with something kind of the broader view of the enterprise, which many of you know as enterprise architecture. Um, Shannon introduced me already, so I won't go into great detail. Just a few things. If you are a Twitter fan, uh, you can follow me at Donna Burbank, and there's a hashtag for today's session, hashtag LessonsDM. I am not the best multitasker in the world, so I'm not one of these presenters that can both speak and answer you at the same time, but I will try to get back to you after the fact um, if you do. A couple more just highlights that relate to particularly to today's session on my background that might be interesting to you. So many of you know me uh, from some of my previous roles way back with Platinum Technologies where I kind of worked on their um, information management and metadata management technologies and did some consulting across the globe there. With ER Studio, um, I was the director of product management that actually built some of the EA features they have in that tool. So was on the BPMN uh, OMG B Business Process Modeling Notation Committee, which was very, very helpful and insightful into kind of actually being a, a stakeholder and actually developing that notation. So felt honored to do that. Um, and any of the features in, I guess, what it was back then called EA Studio, uh, where we kind of put some business process modeling and some EA modeling, uh, all the good features are for me. Anything bad was somebody else's decision. Just <laughs> put that out there. I uh, spent some time with Erwin um, doing data modeling uh, there as well. I've kind of jumped back and forth in my career both in developing products when I feel like building stuff, which I think is really fun, um, and then I get edgy and actually want to work on site with real clients building stuff in terms of projects. So i um, kind of gone back and forth in my career working with consulting and, and with products. Currently I'm running a consulting company, as Shannon mentioned, um, Global Data Strategy, where we sort of do this in practice. Previous to that, uh, I work with a company called Enterprise Architects, um, which by its name was an enterprise architecture business consulting company. We've got a lot of great insights. I've been doing enterprise architecture for a long time. Um, got some particular insights since that was their main focus and less on the data, so I was able to offer some of the data to them and uh, get, learn a bit more deeply from them on enterprise architecture. Um, this is probably unconventional, but I, I did want to give a call out to a longtime friend and colleague, Ian Coward, who taught me a lot uh, that I knew from enterprise architecture. And unfortunately, he passed away earlier this week in a tragic scuba diving accident. So sort of as a surprise to all of us, but I almost could not mention his name. I could not, not mention his name because some of these slides and case studies I did alongside him. So it was sort of a timely, timely event. So if anyone, I know a lot of the names on the call, so if anyone knew Ian, I want to let everyone know there. So. Uh, on a happier note, there is a uh, series of data modeling series this year. Um, you'll see that it's really varied. So um, this month is on enterprise architecture, and we try to break it up. What you won't see, and hopefully by the end of the year you'll see some sort of uh, detailed training on data modeling that we'll be putting together with Dataversity. Um, but we wanted to go broader because, and again, hopefully this isn't controversial, but data modeling in and of itself doesn't mean anything. It shouldn't be an academic exercise. The only reason data modeling is useful and interesting is when it's applied to an actual thing <laughs> or to value in the organization. So as part of an enterprise architecture or building a business intelligence. 
So you'll see, or, or for your career, you'll see some of these topics are, you know, how can that help you as a data architect? Usually in the titles we see a lot of data architects on the call, which is always great. Um, and how can some of these things help you? So we try to kind of mix it up. Uh, Chen and I each year kind of look through some of the trends in the industry and data modeling and metadata are always a big topic, so we try to apply it to that. So hope you can join us um, throughout the year. Um, they're all out there live if you want to register ahead. Um, it'd be great to see you. So today we're going to talk a bit about, and if you've heard me present before, I always put data in the context of business transformation where I can because that is honestly why I'm still in the business. My first degree was in economics, and I'm very interested in business. And when I work with companies, that's what I always love doing, of not just solving data, which can be fun. You know, I can nerd out on data <laughs> like anybody else. Um, but it's only interesting when you're doing something with it, right? And I think this is seeing a lot of the growth of data in the industry is that company, you know, non-data people are finally getting it, that this can really transform their business. So how can enterprise architecture and data modeling specifically within that uh, help with that? And then I'll go through a few tools and components that are part of enterprise architecture and some case studies where um, we've done this in actual practice that should maybe relate to what you're doing. So as I mentioned, data is driving business transformation. And I know that sounds like a marketing headline. And you'll see most of the vendors kind of who are any way related to this uh, calling this out. But it's true. I mean, when you think of you know, what they're calling the digital transformation or data-driven transformation or just business transformation, so much of that is really driven by the availability, volume, and interconnectedness of data. And it really is transforming the way organizations do business. Just think of something, even like an Amazon. You know, their recommendation engine, which drives a lot of their business, is all based on data, right? They have data on the purchasing po patterns of you know, millions of customers around the world and can use that to help you and help them, you know, uh, buy more related things. And so many companies that I'm working with, and not, not all, unfortunately, sometimes they've come up with this funny idea before I even came on site, but you know, they'll have the poster on the wall, we are, a, we are a data company. And this could be anything from a telco company to an insurance company to a product company. Folks are getting that the real value is the data that's generated from their doing business and how they can take that data and really leverage it to business advantage. And when you're thinking of how can I leverage that to business advantage, there's kind of subtleties to that. So I like to break it out into um, two different ways. So one is I would call business optimization there on the left. If, how do I become a data-driven company? And simply that's how do we do what we do better, right? So if I had better information on my customers, could I put together better marketing campaigns? Uh, I could have that elusive as everyone wants to have, you know, 360 view of customer. Um, could I use better products? You know, a lot of a product that is a, you know, maybe from a telco company or an online store or an online game or an online, you know, anything where you can track the usage of that product, um, you can actually see what works and what doesn't. Um, so you can actually link that into your product development. You know, customer support. A lot of the companies I'm working with are doing a very good job of this. Can I actually see what my customers are saying through you know, text analytics of support logs? You know, some really interesting things there. You know, in the standard, if, if we manage our data better or our company better through better data, um, you can lower the cost. So we've been doing this for a while. That's fine. I think we can do it a whole lot better now with some of the new technologies that are available, um, which is exciting and, and driving a lot of the innovation in the industry. I think the one on the right is a bit new. Again, you could argue we've always been doing this, but I think the the tools that are available now, the volume of data that's being generated is really driving this idea of becoming a data company. So either literally monetizing the information you have, selling it to other groups. Um, uh, for example, I worked with a telco, telecom, whatever, everyone has a different word for that. Um, and they were actually selling their, you know, anonymized, of course, data to some city planners uh, to see, you know, if you think everyone going everywhere nowadays has their cell phone, they could use that to track uh, travel patterns throughout the city. And how can I optimize rail networks or road building based on the data of something completely different but used for a different purpose? Um, they had worked with a um, retail company when this particular retail company didn't have a, oh, what do you call it, oh, a, a loyalty program, you know, one of the benefits to a company when you're a loyalty program. They can see what you're buying and kind of customize things for you. Well, they didn't have that, so when people are in the store, they had cell phones. <laughs> they could literally see footfall analytics of where people were going, what they were buying, um, you know, what, what ad, ads in store were working best, that sort of thing. Um, social media, you know, kind of seeing purchasing patterns, um, you know, ad, ad placement is <laughs> sort of a big one. 
Um, energy, we worked with an energy company earlier this year where, uh, again, you know, energy is one of those commodities that they're actually trying to sell less of, right? They're actually actively helping their customers be more energy efficient, which when you think about it is sort of weird, right? You're actually trying to help your customer buy less of your stuff. Um, so they were saying, how can we use this to actually have a brand new product? And with the idea of smart meterings, they could actually have services to help you know, ma- manage, shut off your heat from your cell phone while you're at work. You know, some really interesting next generation things. But they can only do that because they have the data. So it's kind of exciting. And they, they were one of the folks that did have on their wall, we are now a data company. And we're really seeing the value of the data itself. So some exciting things out there in the industry, and I think what's exciting for us as data professionals is that, well, I guess we could say finally, right, we have a seat at the table, um, and we are getting the voice. I think I've worked with a lot of business um, executives where they would love to have someone really explain, I know we have this data, what could we do with it? So, you know, in the past, we'd get the business requirements from the business, and we implement a product to meet those, and that still happens, and that's great, but I think we can now often come, you know, think of the classic data scientist. I saw a pattern in your data. Did you realize you could do this, that, and this, and link it together and get this new insight? And I think that's a great opportunity for us. And that does link an enterprise architecture, which really links to your, your business opportunity. Um, and you can really support things like organizational change. So I think it's an exciting time to be in data, which is why I'm still here um, and not out skiing, because <laughs> I think it's sort of fun. Um, and I hope you do, too. And hopefully by the end you'll see some specific ways you might be able to help your organization, which uh, kind of leads to the, the point at hand of how data modeling fits with the idea of this, what is enterprise architecture, um, as, a, as a data person, we always have to start with de- definition, so I'll do that. So this is a lot of, again, uh, they say the cobbler's children always have no shoes. So I think us as an industry, given that part of our main job is creating definitions, um, are pretty horrible at doing that ourselves. <laughs> right? So usually there's six definitions for something. Um, so similarly, there's a lot of different definitions of enterprise architecture out there. But this one I liked. It was from Gartner a few years back. Because I think it really hits on what I'm trying to show today. If you sort of broke it up into different paragraphs just for readability. But um, enterprise architecture is a discipline for you know, responding to the part I, I bolded, disruptive forces by identifying and analyzing the execution of change toward desired business vision and outcomes. So you think about it, that's really what I was just talking about, that innovation, that really disruption of the entire business processes by analyzing it and looking at the big picture. Um, but at the bottom, you can read through the rest at your leisure, um, they made sure to point out that this is also driving the evolution of the future ch- state architecture. So that's really the foundation to do that. And, and they shouldn't be mutually exclusive activities. And I'll, I'll touch this later in the presentation. I think our enterprise architecture, probably just like data modeling, probably just like a lot of things that smart people do, <laughs> folks seem to think, oh, it's too academic. It's going to take too much time. It's head in the clouds. It doesn't mean anything. And one of the reasons I like this particular quote is it really hit on both. You know, au contraire, this is actually helping you analytically look at your business and help innovate with with direction. Um, But at the same time, you need to have the architecture that supports that. So even I'll I'll go into more case studies at the end, but even the few I mentioned, you can't do all these great next generation things with your data unless you have the architecture for that that data to build it with. So I think a lot of us on the call – understand that, but sometimes making the connection to folks that, you know, where data and architecture and that whole concept is new to them. I sort of like this quote because it kind of balances uh, both of them together. So um, if you're a data architect on the call, uh, sort of a definition that might work for you is if you've never heard of enterprise architecture, if you think of just how you have to model the data in an organization, think of you're modeling the organization itself. Right, so to step back, and, and a lot of us who are modelers tend to do that. I'm always drawing something with a, on the back of a piece of paper, and that you know we tend to be visual people. How do I plan it out? How do I draw it? How do I pr- make make it simple? Because I think it's something else we like to do as architects. Um, so I think what are the motivations? What are the goals? What are the business capabilities and processes that we can put together that run the enterprise, as well as, and that's really on the business side, as well as as I mentioned before, you need an architecture that supports that. So. If we have our business goals and the capabilities and processes that are either built or we want to build, how do you have the application, the data, the networks, you know, all the, the stuff on the back room uh, that needs to support the organization to make that happen, which is one of the beautiful things about an enterprise architecture because it looks at all of those. <clears throat> so here's, um, again, we're sort of focusing on the data aspect more on this, but there's a lot of facets of enterprise architecture. Uh, here's one way to look at it in some of the artifacts below that. 
uh, within enterprise architecture. So if you think of the business view, you know, what are we trying to do as a business? What are, we, what are the business processes for the process view, the data view, and then mapping the data to the process? So we'll show some examples of these, but with the business, you know, we actually have a uh, an artifact in our practice we call the motivation model. Actually, writing down your motivations. I uh, was with one consultant, and he actually did this as kind of a personal development. You know, we're, we're doing it for uh, you know a project, but you could do it for anything. Why are we doing this anyway? If we all just step back, sometimes that's the most important question of all. Uh, we can build the best architecture, but if no one's ever going to look at it, right? <laughs> and what business areas are we supporting? What are the drivers? And then how does that map to data? And then specifically, you know, what are the business processes that data is supporting? Is, is it the front end online sales process? Is it the you know, back end supply chain? All of the above. Um, and often, and I'll talk later in one of the case studies. I'm sure many of you on the call have done things like data governance and data quality. You know, especially with data quality, that so much ties to process and people because you think, you know, what's the classic analogy? If if your data is the pond. I hesitate to use the word lake, <laughs> but um, you know, and you clean the pond. If you're not cleaning the rivers feeding the pond, and the data is still coming in badly, um, you need to fix that. So sometimes it's something as simple as a data entry problem that the person wasn't aware. And so really looking at that process and see how data is affected and created throughout that process is pretty key to really using data or fixing data. So when we talk about enterprise architecture itself, there's a number of different frameworks. Again, like definitions. We always like to have several to choose from <laughs> in our industry. Um, and I show you a couple, there's more than this even, um, but a couple of the popular ones that I've used or have been out there. I'm a fan of the uh, Zachman framework in its simplicity. Um, and I think that's why it gained so much popularity. Uh, call it to John Zachman if people don't know him. He's a lovely gentleman. And he's generally at the uh, Dataversity and, and DEMA conferences. I think he'll be at EDW this year. Um, and he's generally he's a very nice gentleman if you can go up and talk to him. Um, but basically, it's very simple. If you've heard me present on metadata, I use similar categories for metadata. It's basically the who, what, where, why, and when. So if you think of enterprise architecture as the who, what, where, why, and when of the organization, so the what is going to be your data, and, and this one's a bit hard to read. He's upgraded everything. His older one was more simple, but um, a little bit easier to read for us old folks. Um, but the bottom, if you think at the bottom, it's more of the actual architecture, the systems, et cetera, um, that are driving the organization. As you move up, almost think of this as kind of the log uh, physical, logical, and conceptual Model. So he has kind of the, you know, the enterprise vision perspective, the business perspective, uh, the architect perspective, and then the actual engineer, you know, building the systems. So in my mind, that's very similar to the levels of data modeling. But he does that with everything. So it's the who. When you think of the organization structure, the where, think of your, you know, your networks, the why in terms of motivation. It's a very nice kind of holistic look just to see, am I catching everything um, in the organization? And again, I'll talk about this later in the presentation as well. This can seem overwhelming, and we don't want it to. Um, generally, an organization starts either broad or deep. You can do a high level across all of the high, who, what, where, why, when, from a very high level cons um, view of everything, and then maybe go deep into one. Maybe the data is where I want to drill down into. Some organizations go and, and complete, complete depth and breadth across all of these, um, but other folks kind of pick in that priorities to um, to really focus on one area. And we'll talk a little bit about how you might want to focus as well. Um, another framework that is out there that I've used as well, when you think of uh, TOGAF, um, they have an EA framework um, from the open group, and there's a lot of documentation out there. Partly because of that documentation, it can seem on the surface as being a little more complicated, but complicated is always in the eye of the beholder, right? It's you know whatever you're used to, and they all have their strengths and weaknesses. And you'll see here is some of the same idea. We're looking at you know the business, the data, the applications, the technology, um, as well as the capabilities and vision uh, across the organization. So similar idea. You're kind of looking broad in terms of what do I have, what do I want to do with it, and then you can go deep into you know actually creating your network diet. We're not going to get into those type of things today. Um, but often when I was doing more detailed enterprise architecture, say I were, for example, to go deep into the data, there's probably an application or a network or, you know, each each group could go very deep into some of those and we all work together at that high level was kind of the place where we met in the middle. Um, and my advice, strong advice here, is really to find that balance. And the thing that helps you find that balance is the business value. Uh, one of the, as I mentioned already, 
enterprise architecture can have a, a bad rap as being seeing this overly burdensome academic thing that's just a waste of our time and we have stuff to actually do, right? I'm seeing less of that. Again, a lot of these things we've been doing in the industry for a long time are seeing a bit of a resurgence, things like governance and enterprise architecture where I think for a while it was, ah, just go build things, kind of this wild west in the, you know, the lower right. Um, I think there's a balance. I think it's very true. I've been on enterprise architecture prog programs that were too academic, and it was just let's build everything at the nth level of detail and think philosophically for hours about every bit, you know, fill out every box of the Zockman framework. You know, nothing's really going to get done if you go that deeply. I'm a big fan of this picture. <laughs> the thinker with a laptop. Um, but at the same time, and I wish more people said this, because I think some of us on the call can be frustrated by this as well, if you're too Wild West and just say, oh, we're going to skip that modeling phase altogether, Nothing gets done there either because you're in chaos. So um, you might, my voice just got all agitated. Right? You can see that that bothers me when you're on a project. Oh, we don't have time to plan. Let's just get going. You know, I'm a I'm a big hiker fan. You know, I free time when I haven't, um, and just think you're, you're lost. So I'm not going to look at the map. I'm just going to start running. Well, you can get really tired really fast. Um, it'd be a lot better to look, quickly look at the map. You're not going to study the map and get every atlas known to mankind. You're going to quickly look at the map, find where you need to go, and go with it. And I guess that's why I'm trying to say, when done correctly, enterprise architecture actually helps improve the efficiency and better align with the business priority. So I think every project should take something from the enterprise architecture, even if it's quickly – and I say this to a lot of my clients who might be – you know, we'll put together a proposal and they'll see, wow, we're going to have to do this – motivation model and this architecture model and all these things, that seems like a lot of time. And I say, if, if we start a couple hours in an afternoon and that's enough, that's fine. You might not even need to go past that. So give it a chance. And sometimes that one to two hour session bashing out a motivation model really changed the direction of the project. And we were glad we just had time to take a breath and think before the project. So that was sort of a long-winded way of explaining this slide, but um, I think it's really key in what we're going to be covering. So back into actual things are the tools that we can use to build this, because uh, I think a lot of the folks in this call are implementers and you want to actually get stuff done. I'll kind of go through some, I'll start with the data modeling piece. Wouldn't necessarily normally start here in an enterprise architecture project, but given that a lot of the folks in the call come from here, that's why I'm starting here. Um, we'll go back to the bigger picture in a bit. So when we think of uh, data modeling, um, I always show the, almost always show the slide in my presentations, and every time I don't show it, I have to bring it up, or I wish I had brought it up. So here it is, this idea of the different levels of data models. And I think one of the reasons it's good to show is because people can, we can start talking in circles. So many people think of a data model um, as just this physical side. I'm going to reverse engineer, and I'm going to get my structures from Oracle. That's great, and there's definitely a place for that in enterprise architecture. I think often when we're thinking of the business side, we're more up here um, where the yellow is. So if you're not familiar with that, that's your conceptual data model. What are the high-level business concepts? If I'm doing a business transformation, what is the data I need to worry about? Is it my products, my customers, my vendors, my suppliers? You know, really at kind of that high-level business domain level. And, you know, the data modelers in the call can get a chuckle out of this one. They'll know, you know, what do I mean by customer? which, you know, again, it can seem so simple, but if you don't have those basic definitions at the beginning, are we talking about human customers or B2B customers, you know, actual enterprises? And then when you start fleshing out the logical model, you might see the difference. Okay, let's get customer gender. Well, we're talking about organizations. You know, we wouldn't have that as more your, you know, your company ID number or your your tax code number or something. So it's good to start. Again, it could, could be a very simple whiteboarding session. could be a very detailed model. Um, but do it <laughs> in either case. Um, and then the logical, start to flesh out some of those business rules if you think of that Zachman framework. You're kind of going down the framework into the depth here. Um, that kind of gets the clarification of your business rules. Starts to think about data structures. Uh, we could argue back and forth on whether you need to or not. I'm a big fan of that because it does start to get some of the business rules. Can a customer have more than one account? Do they have to have an account to be considered a customer? All that kind of stuff, um, which is key to the business. And then the physical, and again, some folks think of enterprise architecture as just up here in the top, um, because often enterprise architecture is just that sort of broad, very high-level models. I'm also a big fan of kind of looking at the reality, kind of the top down, bottom up, uh, which sort of leads me to this too. So sometimes, um, well, I think always you should do that top down. What, what are we worrying about in, with our business? What are the main things we have as a business that we that are our data assets, our products, our customers, our uh, linkages between things, 
and then also do a bottom up. Sometimes you'll find stuff you didn't know. Oh, I didn't know we had this much information about the purchasing patterns, or I didn't realize we had product information, or just to find out where it is. And so um, also to get the complexity of how hard this is to manage, because the devil's in the details. We have this great theoretical enterprise architecture, but at some point we have to build something. And in my practice, we always do some sort of analysis of business benefit. Well, I'm sure everybody does this to some level. You know, business benefit versus complexity to implement. So it could be, you know, the best thing we could get is linking our customers' purchasing patterns with their other friends they have online and kind of marketing to them. Well, we don't have that information, right? Or we have that customer information, but it's in 26 different databases. But look at our customer or product data is all in one nice clean database. Maybe we start here. You know, again, you you have to kind of do that iterative back and forth between what you have and what the conceptual business value is and what the physical reality is. Um, So I'm a big fan of kind of looking at both and really kind of going back and forth and seeing. um, You might need to change your physical structures based on some of the ideas you you had up top. So uh, just quickly, if you haven't seen a conceptual data model, um, if anyone was at um, Enterprise Data Governance Online, we showed one of these, and there's a lot of discussion on this. Um, couldn't you just do this with sticky notes? Yes, we have this as a <laughs> slide. But this is really your brainstorming slide. Um, just another in full um, disclosure, uh, this really is a logical data model with full attributes and uh, data types and all of that sort of thing. Um, and we obviously we just hid that. And this particular tool I'm using, you can actually just show the definitions as part of the model. And I've used this a lot in kind of, you can whiteboard, and you can either take the uh, results of your whiteboard and put it here, or sometimes, you know, depending on your skill and savviness and how easy the tool is, we can use the tool itself in your whiteboard. Uh, because the beauty of that is the metadata is already in there, and then you want to go and link that to your um, physical structure. Uh, you can do that easily. And someone's asking which tool, um, and I never say tools. I just think that's, I try to be vendor neutral. Um, but it's one of the top three that we tend to, <laughs> to all look at. Um, the benefit of this is you see the definition right there. So it could say, you know, a customer is a person or organization who's rented a movie within the past year. Um, or you could say, well, we don't send, sell to people at all. We just sell to organizations. You know, sometimes just showing a simple definition just like this can really, you know, pull out some interesting things. You can also highlight if folks are having, you know, kind of those definitions, the customer is a customer. You know, <laughs> we've all seen those. They're not very helpful. Um, and sometimes just brainstorming like this, you can show them. Um, then on, on a, uh, going to the logical model, and, and again, that's where you start adding attributes. So what are the key things we, we worry about? Customer, first name, last name. Sometimes going here, too, can start to flesh things out. I gave that example. Um, you know, here's our, our customer. What's their first name? Well, an organization, right? We don't have, oh, is, is, a, is it a person that works for an organization? You start to get all these different, you know, business rules. Um, you know, do you have different roles? A student or a tutor is a different type of role. So there's a lot of information there that you start to flesh out, cardinality, that kind of thing. So, yes, a lot of times you're thinking of a physical structure, but really the focus here should be on a business um, and the business rules around it. Can a customer have more than one account, that kind of thing. Um, and I, and you know, I often just started a broad brush again, depending, and then you can go as detailed as you wish. Um, this idea of whiteboarding, I'm a big fan, you know, especially if we're working with business users. And plus, if anyone has heard me present or worked with me or seen me, I can't sit still. <laughs> so I really like the physicality. I'm always the one to volunteer. I'll put the sticky notes on the board. Um, the actual physicality of having a conversation and physically sticking something on the board, I think, is nice. Um, I think some business people have been traumatized. We just want to have a data modeling requirement session. And you walk. I have been in these rooms where you have the enterprise logical model that takes up each wall and spans a thousand entities. If you don't mind, we're just going to take your afternoon and go through all of these definitions. You know, funny they run away and never came back, right? So, focus what you just need from them. You know, we're just trying to get some. Are these the main things you worry about in your company. You know, regions and policies and agents and account. Is there a difference between an agent and a a seller, do you have external agents, internal agents? You know, sometimes just a, an hour, half hour with a business unit, with a business person with some of these key definitions can go a long way. You know, maybe you need to bring them in later for some of the, the different definitions. Um, but it's often an easy way to start. Um, just for the uh, for clarity, I am not. I want anyone to quote Don says you should do your entire enterprise architecture with a sticky note. No, it's just it's a brainstorming, and that should be then translated to something more permanent with metadata behind it, like an EA tool or a data modeling tool or a metadata repository, or even just something like a Confluence or a SlideShare or something um, to make sure that you have the metadata and, and roles behind this. 
Um, okay, so that's a bit on data, and I started with data because we're data folks. I generally, um, when we think of an enterprise architecture, would start more like something like this. Uh, we call it the motivation model. I've seen a lot of different displays of a motivation model, and I'll show you one on the next slide that we use. Um, but you don't have to be married to that. The idea is this is sort of that formal definition of why we're doing this. Again, it doesn't have to take weeks. It could be an afternoon. It could be 15 minutes of folks just saying, why are we doing this? Because we're trying to increase sales. Why are we trying to increase sales? Because we're getting a lot of competition in the market and everyone else is online and we're not. You know, <laughs> Something very simple. Because um, I've been in projects where at the end of the day everyone had a different goal and it wasn't seen as a success. Not because the technology wasn't great, but because people – it didn't tie to their day job. It's sort of the so what. Um, so one place to start is generally the corporate mission. And I guess a lot of us who might be in the weeds of data, do you even know your company's corporate vision? So it might be printed out on the walls um, of your organization and HR and executive management put it up there. Have you taken the time to read it? Do you understand it? Um, and, you know, sometimes these can seem silly in their simplicity, but I'm a big fan of if it's simple and easy to understand, someone took a long time to make it that simple, right? So if you look at this, where are saying to be the most comprehensive, customer-driven online shopping experience in the market. Well, there's a lot of things there. You're, you're trying to be um, comprehensive, but you're all trying to be online. Maybe we weren't online before. Um, so, you know, a lot of things there were not maybe focusing on brick and mortar. You know, so a lot of things in that small uh, – mission that we can say. Uh, the vision is kind of where we want to head. So we're, we're here at the mission today. What are we trying to do differently? And in this case, again, this is just a hypothetical organization, but we're trying to transform the way customers purchase goods through social media-driven connections, which really is more getting on to the idea of social media and, and communities and that kind of thing, which might be a completely different way of working for this particular company. So externally, why are we doing this? You know, maybe because everyone else is doing it, right? Everyone's buying online. We're not going to be the one to put out a lemonade stand in the front yard because uh, no one's going to come. Um, and then what are we trying to do internally? Well, maybe part of this is that we want to get that integrated view of customer, but there's disparate systems across the organization, and we might need something like an MDM or a warehouse or something to aggregate that and understand it. And then for your project, your data-driven project, your enterprise architecture project, what are we trying to do? Well, maybe we're trying to specifically improve customer satisfaction or, you know, whatever, and there should be several goals, not just one, um, but actually have a goal so when you meet it, people can say, oh, that's great. Um, you know, I want to kind of uh, show some success. And then some specific objectives. So how are we going to meet those goals? Well, here we can link purchase history with social media activity. That's a specific thing we're going to do with our data or with our enterprise architecture that we can kind of do. Um, here's an example of one, and I, I generally like to put it in some sort of infographic type thing. I think people just sort of consume that better. So this is really kind of a fictional artful art supplies, right? Well, you'll see you know, basically what you just saw on the previous slide, what the mission, what the vision is, internal, external drivers. And then this was for more of a data governance type thing. What are the, the main kind of marketing headlines, right? We can always sort of roll our eyes at marketing. But why does marketing work? Because it, it drives to what we care about and in a simple way. So what are we doing? We're trying to drive accountability, quality, and culture. Or, you know, put some graphics in there. Really, really think about how you might do that. But the most important thing is we're all driving in the same direction. This is the why of why we're going to do any enterprise architecture program. So, again, whether this takes several weeks of iteration, talking to different stakeholders, I'm not going to go deep into that here, but, you know, a big part of this is to make sure you're not just talking to yourself. So, you know, look at the organization and all the, these things we're talking to. Did we talk to marketing, right? Did we talk to the brand strategy group? Did we talk to the, you know, the customer service group? All these different people that might be you know, involved in this, make sure they are involved um, and our stakeholders as well. Another big thing I like to do is really look for these levers or levers or whatever, however you say it from wherever you're from. And really that's, you know, finding that quick win. So, and this sort of gets back to what I was saying before. So, you know, first of all, identify the areas that are going to have the highest business value. What is the biggest thing? You know, and some of these things are the best thought of by walking around the building, taking a walk, looking around, or just thinking. What is the biggest thing we're talking about? It's this huge, big new campaign for a big product launch. Can we align ourselves with that? Uh, that's where, you know, again, it could be a smaller technical project with bigger, bigger, b bigger business value. You're going to get a lot more kudos than trying to do something big and fancy and techy that nobody cares about. Um, or, you know, a second 
uh, second bullet, you're rearranging the deck chairs in the Titanic, right? So, you know, we're, we're trying to polish the counters of the restaurant, and the company is going to online ordering. You know, we're not even going to be using those, co- you know, counters. So why are we doing this anyway? Um, and as with anything that has value, it makes sense to model it. So let, let's look at these eight ways that, you know, have value the business. And, and I kind of kind of like this business value. I really see that as where data can be the fulcrum, right? So there's a lot of effort that needs to be done. There's a lot of load. But what, you know, what's the value where data can really provide something transformative to the business? So, you know, we often go and just prioritize. So what would be the biggest new thing that we're going to worry about? And in this case, it is the launch of a new product. We have this big new marketing campaign. Um, so what are the big drivers we just talked about? And then you can actually, in, in the data world, start filtering what are those data elements that we care about and focus on those. Because as you know, there's thousands of, that's where this conceptual model comes in. There's thousands of different areas of, of data across the business. You can't manage everything effectively. So pick the stuff people care about uh, that relates to this. Uh, with a marketing campaign, you probably need customers and products and partners to sell to and vendors to sell it, um, regions to sell within. Uh, make sure you get those right and, and show the value for that. Um, another thing that's part of an enterprise architecture that I'm a big fan of um, is a business capability model. So this outlines the capability of the organization. This is a very simplified version of one, but you kind of get the idea. Um, just note, as a note there, this is not an organizational chart, and, and sometimes that's a hard switch for people to get. So you kind of think, okay, so what are the big functions of my business? You almost start thinking of the org chart. Well, I have HR, and I have development, and I have engineering, and I have sales. It's helpful to step back from that and think, what are the core capabilities that we do as a company, especially when you're thinking of business transformation? This can often be where some of these aha moments you know, can be. And this might be, well, one of our main things is we have a great source of data. How can we manage that? Or it could be that you know, our product isn't really that differentiated, but we've got a great distribution system or whatever, it can, kind of just stepping back and saying, what are we really good at or what do we have a lot of functions at? Or it could be, um, this is the business vision we want and we want to sell everything online. You know, we don't even have a web team, <laughs> so how can we sell online? So we need to add a capability. So again, this is kind of your conceptual, if you think of a conceptual data model, this is your conceptual business capability model to really get at that. So. Again, what, what are the core areas of the business? This is our fictitious artful art supplies again. We have research and development. Uh, we have branding and go-to-market, and we have sales and distribution. Probably pretty simplistic. There's probably a lot more. And then we have things like back-end, uh, kind of your core business functions. And then we have kind of the shared services like human resources, you know, legal services, and that kind of thing. And then with each of these, okay, within product development, we have it's kind of a functional decomposition type of thing here. We have R&D, we have product manufacturing, packaging, and that kind of thing. This is helpful in and of itself. Um, what I find helpful is then, you know, based on these high priority business data elements we or business domains we created, can we overlay that into some of these business capabilities? So, if we have customer data, what are the capabilities? using that or leveraging that or needing that, you know, we're not going to go into that level of detail, but or owning that, et cetera. And you can kind of create a, a heat map. So wow, you know, it looks like you know, sales procurement and quoting using a lot of different data types, whereas, you know, recruitment really isn't using any data at all. Should they? Should they be looking at, you know, employee data? Yes, but that's not one of the things we're worried about. Um, so kind of just a helpful way to do that heat map of what do we do as a business? Let's look broad term of how we need to change that, and then specifically, how does data support these key capabilities? Going kind of a next step further is the idea of a process model. Huge fan of these as well. So I have seen companies, again, do this on a whiteboard. You can do it with sticky notes, if you wish, with lines. Um, you can do this in something like a Visio. Or I've had one customer that you know, was an engineering type customer, and they had each business engineering process to the nth level of detail, which was very useful to their business, and it was actually a lot automated. Um, that particular customer actually, and they linked it carefully to their data, they actually had a quality issue that had sort of made it into the news and, and <laughs> was obviously not a situation they wanted. But because they had their processes and the data ma- um, kind of mapped to that, they were able within 24 hours to find the problem, resolve it, and actually have a press release to show that they were fixing it. And in this particular case, one of the reasons I had come in, they had done this again before me, um, 
the IT team got a whole lot more budget. <laughs> they were actually seen as the heroes of this scenario. So, you know, for the folks that said, oh, this seems so theoretical, so architectural, and you know, do we really need it? Well, when crisis came, they were really glad they had it. Um, but I've also worked with customers where really it's just a, you know, quick and dirty, you know, who's using this data and how. And it can really help you understand the business usage. So here, if you're not familiar, um, this is kind of a BPMN style. I usually don't get too dogmatic about getting every line and box correctly. It's more, how can we use this? Um, but a lot of notations have this, this idea of a swim lane. So who are your actors or the people? So I have product development, I have supply chain accounting, and marketing. This might be for a launch of a product. Um, and this is kind of my own version of this, <laughs> but so I have, you know, your start event, we're going to create launch the product, I have the development cycle, and then within each type of data, what do we look at? So we have a product, we've got kind of the code name of that product, um, because we're just kind of, we don't want to make the real name yet, we're just using something. We kind of have the product components, the names of that component, that's the type of data that's touched in that process. Then they might pass it out to supply chain accounting, is this even feasible to build? Maybe it's too expensive. Maybe those parts you had in that product development are made of gold, and that's way too expensive. So they might do the pricing and costing and that kind of thing. And they might, pay, if it's feasible, they might pass it to marketing, and they might create the real name um, of the product. So that's a case where it's the same data kind of being updated by two different groups. So kind of seeing the flow of that, they might create a price that overwrites the. You know, this could be the kind of theoretical price of this is how much based on the cost, and they might look at the market and conditions and kind of change the thing. So what's nice about that, it kind of shows, the well, A, the importance of data, who's using it, uh, who's updating it, creating it, deleting it, that sort of thing, when you think of kind of uh, fixing the data or, or leveraging the data. Um, and then a, another sort of sister brother tool of this, uh, which wins the award for the absolute worst name ever, and I should think of something clever and branded and start using it, but I haven't and can't. So anyone, we got someone deprived for creating a better name for this. It's lovingly known as the crud matrix, which just sounds horrible. It sounds like something gross you have stuck to your shoe, right? Crud. But um and often when I introduce this to somebody who hasn't seen it, they kinda of look at me funny. I'm like, no no skip the name, it's actually really hel helpful. It's basically a quick and dirty way again of showing how data is created, read, updated, and deleted, thus the crud. Um so it could be Again, these are all the types of things that are data. This could be at whatever level. It could be at the domain level. It could be at the entity type level, the attribute. Maybe we're just saying the product name, and this might be helpful. So initially, product development creates that name, um, and then, but it's really marketing that updates the name. They're also the one that deletes it. You know, they might say, you know, we don't have branding rights for this. No, don't use this name anymore. So really, when you're thinking of data lifecycle, this is a huge part of it to really understand the usage of data, create, update, read, and delete. So again, you can get really detailed in this. It's also, again, if you have, you know, you'd start this in an afternoon just to kind of see, especially when you're thinking of things like governance and quality, um, or, you know, enterprise architecture, how you're kind of supporting a lot of these. It's a helpful tool. So, you know, in general, when you think of EA, you can think of it as an architectural uh, discipline. You can think of it as academic discipline. Um, I like to think of it as really a holistic view to support business transformation. So if your real goal here is business innovation and growth, how do we do that? How do we grow the business? Well, we'll probably have to affect our processes. Do we try to do better sales processes? Do we need to hire new people? Do we need to organize our people in a better way? Are there capabilities we need to optimize? Are there new capabilities we need? Um, and then kind of on um, you know, the technical side, what data do we have to support this? What applications are using this? And I guess probably the most important one, why are we doing this, right? What's the motivation? We are trying to be the best, you know, seller of art supplies on the planet, which is very different than, you know, we want to just, you know, stay stable and I want to retire in a few years and hand it off to my family, you know, whatever. This type of thing is uh, very important. So it kind of provides that holistic view in a very from top to bottom, top to bottom way to do that. Um, before we open it up into questions, I did want to go through a few case studies because to me, especially being a practitioner, that's kind of where the rubber meets the road, as they say, and kind of maybe puts this in context. Um, so names obfuscated to protect the innocent, although these are all positive examples. But um, this was um, – actually, we started – we were going to do a master data management project, but it really turned into more of an enterprise architecture project where a lot of the focus we were doing 
was process modeling and linking data to process. So this was an international restaurant chain, and they were doing a, you know, basically they were doing a company strategy. This, they weren't doing a data strategy. They were, you know, all the executives from the CEO uh, across were all saying, what do we, what's our business assets, what, how do we really grow? What they realized that what the, what's the core capability of their business, and it was menus. So they, in particular, had you know, very innovative menus. You know, I'm going to sell a particular food item, and they would change the menu. It'd be very, when you think of it, that's what a restaurant does, right? They're selling food on a particular menu. And they realized, once they did go a little deeper, they didn't really have that single source of all my menus. In fact, they, one of the comments they had was that, I think the printer has better master data than we do because they printed all the menus. So they wanted, and then when you, a lot of the data for that was scattered across different systems from supply chain to how the kitchen prepared the menu to how marketing sold the menu to how restaurant operations supported the menu, you know, how you actually built the food and that kind of thing. So they started a master data management program very wisely to say, can we get that single view of our assets um, to, to support the business? and the governance around that and all that. But as soon as they started, they realized, you know, we need to start with process. Um, and then we actually built some very detailed process models from literally, and this was way fun for me. I got to go into the, the kitchens and talk to the chefs. Um, this isn't the actual chef, but it kind of looked like that. Um, and talk to them, and they got it. You know, that's what I think, you know, us data folks sometimes forget. The people get data once it's put into context. So, we actually he didn't know he was doing it, but we started to whiteboard kind of what he did, and it was a process model with some boxes for data. So it really looked like a, you know, they got kind of a workflow model, and he kind of got that he had these different data things that were touched by it. And we kind of did some high-level data modeling and process modeling with chefs where he went to culinary school, right? So it, they, non-data people can get data. And then we talked to each of these groups. So we talked to the marketing team. So how do they take – and this was literally almost the flow – how do they take that menu from the chef and make it – be something great that people want to eat and buy. To supply chain, how do they buy the eggs and the broccoli and the milk? I hope that's not all one meal. Um, together and get it from the trucks and actually have it be you know, a nice, beautiful thing in the point of sale system where you click it and buy it. And that was all data driven. Um, so we had very detailed process models with how data was updated across the way. And that's what we had to do before we could even think about an MDM hub. That really was the, not the hard part because um, they didn't have a lot of data. It was really just menu names, descriptions, prices, that kind of thing. It was more in the process itself. So that was a great example where it was really the enterprise architecture around it, the people, the process, the organization. And one of the things we started with was a very high-level capability model. What are the groups even touching data before we start the process model? So um, that was sort of an informative one for all of us because we didn't think it was going to start there. It kind of ended up there. Um, another one we worked on uh, was a merger of two big financial services. And in this case, the CEO actually said, you know, one of the reasons we merged is because we knew we had a lot of combined data. And if we can get that together right, you know, we've got more data on a certain customer demographic than anyone else, and, and we can really be strong in the international market. So um, one of the things we did, how do you get that common data foundation? We started by building business capability models for each one of who – this was you know, beyond data at all. Again, to start, it was just these are two very different companies. How do they organize their business capabilities? Are there overlap? Can we get the capabilities aligned first? And then what data can be used to be support this? So do we have, you know, there's one column um, human resources and the other one's people innovation or something, you know, or um, how, how do you align the company? And then the second step was how do you get that common data foundation? But we didn't start with the data in that case because – a lot of it was understanding the business first. Um, another one I'm quite pleased with, because again, for those of you who say business people don't get it, uh, get data, I will kick you if this weren't a webinar, right? <laughs> I think the more and more examples we have, people do if it's explained the right way. So this was an um, international pharmaceutical company, and they, uh, if you know anything about pharma, um, a huge part of their business is R&D. If you want research and development, if you want to stay ahead of the curve and have that new net, next big drug that saves people's lives before anybody else, that's all research and development, clinical development, how you get an idea to the market. Actually, it's fascinating to learn all this stuff, and then how you take it to market. So our, quote, customer was the type of lady on the right. They really PhD research scientists. And what they found helpful is we created these kind of, they called it blueprints of the business. So business process, how you actually take, this was what was so fun to learn, how you actually take a drug from the concept phase to the product development phase to the testing phase to all of that. And then they realized this was an issue. 
how do you what data is either used, updated, deleted, needed? And they found this what was fascinating to me is that they had both process models and then conceptual data models and you'd go into this brilliant research scientist's office and she'd have a conceptual data model with either sticky notes on it or lines crossing it out and changing it around. So they got it, right? It was a description of their business and they were pleased, you know, the, the so what, they were able to find efficiencies in the process, either, hey, we're all doing different things in a different way, or, you know, if I could get that data from the other group and I could get that earlier in the process, then that would speed up our cycle. And that was a big part of it, that kind of information sharing. I didn't know you guys had that. Oh, if I could get that early, that would be great. Or are we using the same definitions in a different way, that kind of thing. So this was, you know, using data and process to really map how the business runs. We didn't, again, we called them blueprints. We didn't say, hey, we're doing this fancy data architecture and, and you have to do a BPMN diagram. That would have made their eyes glaze over, right? But we talked in their terms. We built a flow of their data and their business and then um, they linked the data, and we're able really to get process uh, efficiencies there. Um, so in summary, um, hopefully you've kind of seen the connection that really today's digital transformation is driven by data, which is awesome, and it's great for us. Um, and as part of that, you need to just put data in a bigger context. So in some cases, you can go to the CEO and say, hey, we need a new data analytics project just do this and they'll get it. But really, to do it right, I think you have to take that broader look, step back and look at the, how it's going to affect the people, the process, the capabilities, the motivations, et cetera, to do that. And um, you know, just as you model data, you need to model the organization itself. And I, hopefully I showed you a few tools and artifacts to support that. Um, and then just with anything, again, you, this can get overwhelming. Um, so focus on the areas with the highest business value, generate some quick wins and then go back and finish the rest. Uh, just quick about us, if you're not familiar, Global Data Strategy, we do management consulting across the globe. If you need help, let us know. <laughs> um, and before I go to questions, um, here's my contact information, always happy to answer questions after the fact. Um, and I wanted to just remind you of the modeling series. Uh, next month is gonna be in business intelligence and hope you can join us then. So I will now, hopefully we have some time uh, to open it up for Q&A, Shannon. Indeed, Donna. Thank you so much for this great presentation, as always. Uh, just to answer some of the most commonly quest asked questions that we receive, uh, just a reminder, I will be sending a follow-up email for this presentation by end of day Monday with links to the slides, the recording of the session, and anything else requested throughout, as well as Donna's contact information. Um, so, first question coming in here, Donna, is should uh, CDEs be defined uh, on the conceptual layer or the logical layer? What are the pros and cons? Um, so um, CDE, I'm, I'm assuming you mean the data part. Um, so I would say both. Uh, I'm a big fan of starting with the conceptual and that it kind of sets the the concept, um, for lack of a better word, it really gets the scope. So when we're thinking of kind of the, the business motivations, the business drivers, you know, where are we going to focus our effort, kind of also kind of a uh, inventory, do we cover everything, or what are the big areas of the business, and do we all agree what they're talking about? You know, one company, it was something like, well, we have customers, and we have clients, you know, support calls them clients, are they really different things, is it a different area of the business, maybe brokerage calls them clients, and, you know, it could be a different is it a different thing or, or is it a different, you know, named version of the same thing? So I think that's always a great place to start. I guess the risk of ending there is that, you know, it doesn't go deeply enough. So that's where I think the logical level is helpful. And this is true across any of those artifacts I showed, whether it's a capability model or a process model. I'm always a big fan of just starting high level just to see where you're going. I, I always give the analogy of a house, right? So I'm, I, I, well, I want a new um, summer home. You know, just basics for the architect, I want a big fancy mansion so I can bring, you know, all thousand of my family, or I want a little shack to go fishing in. You know, big big difference, right? Then you kinda of draw out, okay, this is kinda of what it looks like, and then here's the rooms, and then the electrical dot you keep getting different levels of detail. Um so I like it that way. You can't always go top down. Um I think the benefit of the logical is you really start to get some of the crux. And sometimes it might be different people in the room for those. Um the, I guess the downside of that is that you can get stuck in the weeds. And sometimes, even when I've tried to keep it simple, you know, it just starts cascading in terms of the number of entities and, and relationships. But the risk of not doing that is you can miss some key stuff. You know, something as simple as, okay, is this um, 
I don't know, a different kind of policy. Do we have different policies? Are they treated differently? Are the attributes on a public policy versus a private policy versus a academic policy different? You know, all these kind of different things um, can have subtleties. So I, I think you know both can be valuable. Just make sure you're you know the purpose and don't go too much into the weeds unless it's the time to. You know, at some point someone has to go into the weeds if you're building the application because there's a risk of not doing that as well. Um, just make sure you get the right audience and they're doing it at the right time. Fabulous. Are you now? Are you finding it harder to enforce the importance of a model with the move to unstructured data? Are you seeing modelers being left out of the conversation, or do you have in, and do you have any advice for those that are experiencing that? Um, I am actually, ironically, at the enterprise model. I think this is a great way to start showing it. So. Um, you know, I'm, I'm working with a client now, and we kind of very are at this stage of what are we trying to do with our data? We're trying to get, for example, you know, better customer support. And then what type of – what are we trying to do? What are the processes that need to do it? It's online support. It, it's online sales, it's et cetera, et cetera. And then what types of data? So we're all the very conceptual layer. What are our motivations? What are we trying to do? What processes and capabilities are we trying to support? And then at a very high level, what kind of data that is? And in this case, it might be customer um, customer data, which can be very broad. And then you start delving down, and that's almost similar to the answer earlier. And you can say, okay, where does this customer data live? Some of it's in a, a very structured database. Some of it's online. Some of it is through chat logs. Some of it is through call logs. It is totally unstructured. And, and to me, it almost helps sell the need to want to manage that, and then often the business folks, I think I've found often it's the business folks the easiest to sell, because <laughs> they're like, well, how are you managing that? Well, we can't quite, you'd have to kind of create a hive structure on Hadoop. They're like, well, then do it, right? Because if we want to report on it, don't you need some sort of thing to report on? So again, I think at the risk of starting too much in the weeds and focusing on, hey, we have this great new technology to do real-time data analytics without the why and the how and what else is being affected, I think that's often where we can get lost in the shuffle, because we structured data modelers because people are focusing on the new shiny thing and not on the business value and not seeing how it fits in with other things. If you can build this new shiny thing, and I'm sure some of us on this call have been called in after the fact of now we've got the shiny thing and we can't link it with you know the rest of the organization. And that's what enterprise architecture helps flesh out. So um, yes and no. So someone said they like my voice. That just made my day. I've never heard that before. So. <laughs> <laughs> I just read that comment. Like, All right. Um, sorry. <laughs> and I and I we my IT manager and myself always talk about getting distracted by shiny things. <laughs> we we love shiny things. We all can. Um, I just did myself. I saw a great comment. I was like, oh, shiny thing. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there any freely available industry standard business capability models? Uh, there are, um, and there's good uh, groups. I, I guess with any uh, industry model, like the same answer with the. Uh, data model, I would say the risk, uh, the good idea, if you use them in terms of, hey, I wonder what other people are doing, let's take a look at the guide, big fan. Um, you don't want to reinvent the wheel. I, you have limited um, usage when you want to just, because every every company's different. Um, but there's some for insurance. There's um, So, yeah, so it's great to think, okay, so think about how an insurance company, they'll kind of have all similar types of capabilities, we can probably start with that. But I would just take a, you know, because one of the unique areas of a company is how you have your capabilities and strengthen them and organize them, I wouldn't just take it verbatim. So that might be audience um, obvious, but yes, there are, depending on your industry or what you're looking to do. And there's also some kind of forums and things you might want to ask other folks what they can share. Sure, and I think we've got time here for one more question. Uh, you know, we're seeing um, software as a service brought up more and more, as, of course, as the availability, availability is readily available to, uh, to companies. And how do you construct data models from software as a service apps where you only have access to web services? Um, well, um, so in the context of this, this organization, uh, in this presentation, when you think of back to an enterprise architecture, that's where you also kind of want to look at the other areas in terms of the applications using them, that kind of thing. Um, often, you know, there are sort of XML structures, and, and it's more, less about it's more of the data in motion. So you want to think of the interfaces between those services and how it might. You know, when you think of more of a um, oh gosh, a mental block. I need a cup of coffee. You you want more of the 
Oh. It's a very common term, like my first name, but I can't say. You want that common model to see what data is shared across the organization. Um, so that, and then you would kind of think of here's, you know, that's very much at the high level. So what data is shared between these serve? You're not really developing a structure for a database. You're trying to think of what that common uh, shared data set is and how to share it appropriately. So it's just it's kind of a different way to look at the same uh, more data in motion process or the interfaces, which is what's nice about some of this enterprise architecture, kind of look at the applications and who's using them. Well, I'm afraid that is all we have time for today. Donna, thank you so much for another fabulous presentation and especially being so engaged this week after our Enterprise Data Governance Online Conference yesterday. We just certainly appreciate all the, all the education you provide uh, the audience here. And thanks to all of our attendees for being, for being so engaged in everything we do. We just love all the questions coming in and the active participation in our webinars. Just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides, links to the recording of the session at Donna's contact information. And uh, I hope everyone has a great day. Donna, thank you. Thank you.